Hi, and welcome to the third part of these video tutorials. Uh, in this one I want to talk to you about the principles behind mixing. Regardless of whether you're working live or programming your own material, when it comes to mixing the principles are essentially the same. Uh, there's a balance of craft and skill and an art as well. I mean, it, it, it's something that you learn over time. You can't just jump in and be great at it straight away. Um, one of the most important jobs to complete before you start is to seriously listen to commercial mixes of music, um, preferably in the same style and genre that you like to work in, that you're trying to create music in. And learn to learn to create a mixing map of the music you like. Uh, notice when relative instrument levels change uh, in a track relative to other levels of other instruments and relative to where they are in the actual timeline of the song. Um, listen to the amount of effects that are the norm for the style um, and I would kind of try and choose tracks that really represent a benchmark that you want to work to. Um, you know, even practice closing your eyes and, and trying to visualise what the producers are trying to get you to hear in terms of 3D space, in terms of how instruments actually fit together. I would recommend making sure that you finish all your editing, tuning, arranging before you start. And I strongly suggest that you render or bounce your synth parts to audio. And there's three good reasons to do this. Number one, it frees up your computer resources to use in your mix. Um, as well as removing any chance of errors that stressed out plugins can cause. Um, two, it creates a complete track lay that you can archive and return to without referencing the synth that you used. It may not seem important at the moment, but uh, returning to mixes five years on that rely on VSTIs can be highly problematic. You can have moved on system-wise or the plugins can no longer work and you can't get back to the work that you had. Three, it creates a different mindset, uh, removing the synths um, and the possibility to edit these things. It really kind of focuses you in on, on actually mixing. You're no longer in the headspace that says you can change notes or, or melodies uh, and printing audio and taking away those instruments really really kind of changes the headset you're in and gives you a kind of another level of distance at which to approach your mix. Um, so once all your tracks are in audio um, take some time to arrange them into meaningful groups uh, for instance drums together, bass elements, melodic elements, uh, vocals and backing vocals, group these all together and then route them to separate buses. Um, and I've got to em emphasise the importance of that. Don't even think about not doing it. Um, there's no good reason not to and there's many good reasons to do so. Uh, if nothing else it allows you to easily control groups of sound. Um, it, it makes creating stems for either remixing or um, could be your delivery requirement on the mix with a minimum amount of fuss. Uh, a good starting point is to have the following setup on your FX. So if we go to have a look at this. First things to do is set up, and this was a tip given to me by somebody I worked with down in London who had the, the benefit of working with Bob Clear Mountain, uh, and this was what Bob Clear Mountain apparently started with uh, at the start of every mix. Set yourself up uh, a long reverb, a short reverb, a chorus, um, some form of delay, and an ambience, uh, which is a, an even shorter reverb, just like a room reverb. Uh, possibly one of the most underused reverb when people start working with effects they tend to focus on things that are an obvious effect things that make a, a sound change or really kind of come alive and proper use of small reverbs really kind of marks out somebody that's moved on from simple mixing into the kind of more refined elements of placing sounds in a 3d um, environment so once you've got those set up it means that you will also, again, save resources in your computer. You won't be tempted just to put reverbs on every sound that you think need it. And, and while most modern computers can cope with that, you might be working on a system that can't. Um, try and have a very, very light compressor set up on the actual mix bus. 
I'm talking maybe of a ratio of 1.5 to 1 or even 2 to 1 maximum and I can have a low threshold set to it so just very subtle just for a little glue um, to try and get away from having too many plugins on your output at the beginning the number one technical mistake uh, that people make in modern music production is to use plugins because they have them uh, a great compressor plugin will not make your music sound great we're just kind of respecting the basics of the principles behind mixing will and the single most important control in front of you when you're looking at a mixing desk or at your DAW is the fader. Um, it's not sexy, but it's over, it's it's the most important thing that you have to work with when you're setting up a mix. The relative volumes of your arrangement will account for 80% or more of the actual final mix. So set up your mix with no FX and no processing at the start. For me, the second thing to be looking at uh, would be to deal with the panning of these instruments, whether this is to create a realistic sound stage for, for drums or if you're working with strings, having playing things placed in the panoramic field that they're actually meant to be in helps create a sense of realism. Similarly, you may wish to go away from that and create something that is unusual and um, not the norm, but it's definitely what I would look at after looking at the volumes. Uh, once you've got all the instruments panned to where you'd like them, uh, and they, they, you know this has to be just to your kind of feeling it. Not it's not a finished mix, but just till it's appropriate. Um, I would look at creative. Um, I would look at reductive and corrective EQ. I would look at removing you know unpleasant unpleasant subsonics from all manner of instruments, whether they're live or sampled or synth generated it's amazing the amount of you know subsonic almost garbage contained within these signals that you don't actually need um, perhaps you've recorded uh, a vocalist and they were very very close to the microphone you tend to get much more bass coming through on that take and you maybe want to just sort of clean that up a little bit maybe it sounds a bit muddy it should be all about removing things from sounds at the start rather than potentially adding things um, again when people start off they tend to make the assumption that you have to add things with EQ and it's nearly always better to try and remove things instead. Uh, moving on to compression, uh, don't do it just because, um, have a reason and you know I would suggest that some of the reasons for compression would be to balance out various levels of a performance, um, say a part that swings between loud and quiet can often benefit from having the dynamics ironed out a bit. Um, but this can also be done with automation. Um, I would say another good reason would be to like to change the feel on a loop or a beat um, or a performance. Um, changing the dynamic range of a beat can change the focus uh, on a you know on where the beat actually lies, a, a sound hiding in the background can be brought forward that can add a bit of a groove, a slight hit on a drum that, you know, perhaps the drummer was just almost using it to kind of a little bit of feel can suddenly be brought forward and it gives it a much more, you know, groovy feeling. And similarly, that, that hit could have been too loud uh, and you could use it to enhance the, the initial dynamic and bring the, the sense of the beat happening, you know, on the one. All these things can be done with compression. Um, and I would say in conjunction with um, side chaining, it can create a, you know, it can create space uh, and a sense of drive, especially in dance music. You'll hear, a, you'll often hear this kind of pumping sound whereby a synth part or some pad element is actually being compressed in relation to the kick. So eventually the kick is coming in and this other part has been moved out of the way. Um, it's another way of creating some space for an instrument. That's an extreme. Uh, that's an extreme use of it that creates a sort of sense of, you know, energy. Uh, but it can also be used in a much more subtle effect in a way that you're actually not aware. Of. You could have the. You can have like say the, the lead vocal. Actually controlling the level of, other melodic elements in your arrangement and in your mix, so that when the vocal comes in, other things are just slightly compressed out of the way. It's, it's one of these things that if it's done well, you almost don't notice it's happening. 
Um, and I would say moving on to effects, once you're happy with the balance overall, look at adding space to your parts. Um, and I would look at, look at the reverbs that you'd be using that would be appropriate for the style of music you're working in. You know, short reverbs are often overlooked by people starting out. And they're great for giving your sounds, as we're saying, that sort of 3D sound. And it can help gel groups of sounds together. Another good reason for using um, auxiliary sounds rather than just instigating different reverbs as you go. It'll help kind of unify the sound of your track. Delays, echoes, I mean, these things can be used to create additional groove um, and special effect, you know, moments, uh, and, you know, even a sort of sense of, it doesn't have to be sort of large, you know, large delays that create a kind of echoing part or something that sounds like a sound effect. They can be very, very short. Uh, I mean, look at calling up a, a delay, like a sample delay, so it's, you're actually only delaying one side of a, of a track by even kind of 335-ish samples will give you a kind of almost phasey spatial um, effect to bring things forward. If you put that on a kind of percussive or a clap part, not changing the volume of it at all, suddenly this thing will kind of jump out the speakers a little bit more. It's a little bit less mono compatible, but it's it's not it's it's still going to work in mono, but it really sounds great in stereo. Once once you're kind of at that point, it's really time maybe to look at some kind of creative EQing, and this is the the addition, uh, and as well as some removal of frequencies that uh, help your sounds fit together. There'll almost uh, certainly be sounds that you've used that will clash uh, in the spectrum and try and try and decide which instrument needs them more. If you've got two parts fighting for one, work out work out which one deserves effectively the spotlight and then to kind of try and get the other one out the way with EQ or bring that one other one forward in presence. For instance, like if, if you've got a sound that you want to make sound further away, and quite into the distance, it often pays just to take a little bit of the EQ off the top. Uh, there's a natural effect even with air. Air acts like an EQ, so if you've got a sound that moves away, it will become slightly duller as well as quieter and more reverberant. It's not it's not the biggest uh, and most important part of moving something in 3D, but every little bit helps kind of add a sort of sense of sort of professionalism. And when you when you're done with all of that, I would finally look at um, automating your levels and spot FX. As you've got your tracks grouped, you should look at the group automation as well as individual levels. And within each of these, you should consider the value of small performance related automation, as well as larger kind of mix decisions. Uh, it's a very common error when starting to mix, is to try and present every element to its fullest extent. Um, people try and, it's almost like they can't decide what's more important. Uh, and this is where um, you know it will lead to a really kind of crowded, confused mix as you try and fight to get everything in. Try focusing on one thing at a time and take a moment to work out what you think is the most important part at any given time in the track. This is truly where the process becomes art. Uh, it's 100% down to your taste and your judgment and there's there's no plug in for that. And when you've finished, when you've finished a mix, Take that mix and listen to it on as many different sources as you can possibly access. Use a mini hi-fi, um, listen to it in the car if you can. Uh, use a set of headphones. Headphones are, are from, you know, even if they're a cheap set, they will reveal things that sit in front of speakers you just won't notice. Uh, even, you know, even working with these speakers, I'll still put on a set of headphones and I will hear things that I just quite simply don't notice. It, it changes your focus and that, again, it's, it's all about finding different ways to, to remove yourself and come at it fresh and, and get different perspectives of it. The more monitor, the more monitoring systems you can check a mix on and the more they all agree, usually the better your mix is and the more consistent the results are. And as if starting out, don't be put off uh, with your unhappy, if you're unhappy with the results when you start. Uh, remember that this is an art and the craft and it will take you a while to learn.